Good morning. Oh, I'm so glad. Thank you. Because you know what? It's pretty cold outside, and some people stayed home, and that's okay because they want to keep warm. But we're warm in here with our fellowship. Amen? Amen. Um, I wanted to welcome you to Chapel Oak Seventh-day Adventist Church. If you're visiting, I'm so glad you're here and you came out today. And if you're members, I'm even more glad that you came out today. There's just a few things that I want to uh, bring to your attention. Normally, we do restart at our church today, that where we go down and actually um, Kim and Angie, Kim Reese and Angie Helmer and their families, they go down and make the moo, uh, m meal for uh, restart for the homeless people. Um, and that has been canceled today because there's another church congregation that takes care of January. But we are going to do restart next month in February on the second Sabbath. That's when we do restart. So please keep in mind that we also provide the food for this ministry to be cooked and served to the uh, homeless. And you need to see Angie or Kim for donations, for food donations, so that we can provide this meal for these people on the second Sabbath of every month. I just wanted to remind you that Adventurers and Eager Beaver Clubs will meet today, as the schedule says. Pathfinders will not meet today. Pathfinders will meet next weekend as a lock-in off-site. And those of you who are in Pathfinders, I will be sending out an email explaining everything to you. But Pathfinders is not meeting today. I just also wanted to point out that we do have a lost and found in this church. And it is in the work room. Does everybody know where the work room is, where the copier is? Well, when things are left behind, that's where we put those things. And more and more things have been left behind. Um, belts have been left behind. That might be necessary for some of you. Coats have been left behind. That's more necessary for even more of you. And so please go and see if anything of yours is there. If it is not claimed um, at the end of the month, then it will be donated to the Better Living Center. I just wanted to remind you one more time that on Sunday night, tomorrow night at 6.30, we will be having a free preview of the Dave Ramsey's class. And um, we encourage each of you to participate in that if you have a desire to. I pray that each of you will have a happy Sabbath today. Good morning and happy Sabbath. I'm so glad to see all of you out here on this chilly day. Uh, our first song for praise service today is How Sweet Are the Tidings. This is a song that I learned when I was in Maine. I've only heard it sung once in this church, but I really, really like it, and I hope you all like it also. It's on page 442 of your hymnal if you want to use your hymnal. <clears throat> we'll sing one, three, and four. How sweet are the tidings that greet the pilgrims here as he wanders in from home. Soon, soon will the Savior in glory appear, and soon will the kingdom come. He's coming, coming, coming soon, I know, coming back to this earth again. And the weary pilgrims will to glory go.
coming back soon. Our next song uh, will not be on the screen because we couldn't get it. It's The Cleansing Wave. It's on page 332 of your hymnal. And we'll sing 1, 3, and 4 of that as well. Oh, now I see the crimson wave, the fountain deep and wide. page 528 in your hymnal it will be up on the screen and we'll sing one two and four of it a shelter in the time of storm song I knew out of all of these and that is 337 redeemed redeemed 
redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, whose child and forever I am. Redeemed and so happy in Jesus, no language my rapture can tell. I know that the light of His presence with me doth continually dwell. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, His child and forever I am. I know there's a ground that is waiting in yonder bright mansion for me. And soon with the saints make perfect, at home with the Lord I shall be. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, His child and forever I am. Thank you. Today's call to worship is Psalms 146.5. Happy are those who are helped by the, by the God of Jacob. Their jo hope is in the Lord their God. Let us bow our heads and pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for such a wonderful day, but please help the snow to go away, <clears throat> and please help us to get a good blessing from the sermon today. Amen. Let's all stand for our opening song, page 260 in your hymnal, Hover O'er Me, Holy Spirit, all four verses.
exactly what time it is. Children, go rob your parents and have a children's story led by Mr. Burke. Thank you. Well, good morning, good morning. There's a pretty famous text I think you've probably heard before. John 16, 24. It says, ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. Now, many, many times when we ask Jesus for something, he says yes and he gives it to us. But sometimes he doesn't always answer our prayer right immediately in the same way we would expect. You know, when you read the story of when Jesus was here on earth, sometimes he, he, many times he healed people. He just touched them and then they would be well, or he would say something and they would be fine. But other times he would tell them to do something. Like he told the lepers, go show yourself to the priests. And they were healed on their way to the priests. Or he told one man, put mud on your eyes and then go to this pool and wash it off. And when he washed it off, he was blind. He, he could see after that. The story today is kind of along that line where Jesus didn't answer this um, boy's prayer directly. The story is about a little boy named Donald, and he lived in northern Idaho, and they had a nice farm uh, where they lived in, and you know where they worked, and lots of land and a barn and stuff like that. But one thing his farm didn't have that he wanted was a pony or a horse. He wanted to ride a horse around. And he says, Mom, is it okay if I pray for a horse? And his mom said, sure, you can pray, but I don't know. How about getting a horse? We'll see what we can do, but I'm not sure we'll be able to get one. So he prayed and prayed and prayed for a horse, and he kept praying. And then that summer, his mom and Danny and his little sister went to visit his grandparents and his, and his aunt. They had to travel by car, and they drove in the car for a long way. And while they were there, their aunt said, I have a Doberman Pinscher a dog. It's a nice little puppy. You know, we have, we have a dog, and our dog had puppies. And it's a good dog. Wouldn't you like to take a dog home? And the mom says, no, you know, we have dogs at our farm already. We don't need any new dogs. And, and but his aunt said, oh, please take it. I don't know what else to do with it. Maybe you can give it to somebody else or something like that. So I said, all right. So they took the dog home. And then they advertised the newspaper, would anybody like a dog? And sure enough, somebody called up and said, um, we would like a dog. And so they went and visited it and, and said, oh, this is a very nice puppy. Can we have it? And they said, well, yeah. And they said, well, you know, we can't pay anything for this dog. But guess what we have? Or we have something that we would like to trade for you. And guess what they had to trade for the dog? Oh. That's right. They had a nice Arabian pony. Arabian colt that was just young 
And it was a little bit wild, but Donald learned, took it home, and they got a trailer and took it home to his house, and he took care of it and, and learned how to care for the horse, and his joy was com complete, as a text says, or joy was full, because he had prayed to God, and God had given him a dog, and then God used a dog to get a pony for him, all right? So when you have some looking for something, pray to God for it, and then look for blessings that may not be exactly what you want, but may get you what you need eventually. You can go back to your seats. There's probably no part of the worship service that Adventists know better than the offering. And periodically I'm asked to do the offering appeal, and, and I've, I've often thought, you know, why don't we just say pass the plate? We know, as Seventh-day Adventists, that, um, that we're going to uh, return to our Lord and Savior those blessings that he, he, he has given to us and has entrusted to us. Uh, for his use. Um, and so I've often thought that this element of the worship service, the offering appeal, is just sort of redundant. But uh, it does serve a purpose because, you know, when we think of offerings, I looked it up in my new Christmas Bible that I have here. It has a dictionary slash concordance. So if I don't understand what the word is, it's actually going to give me the definition. And it says, offering, an act of worship. And so I've never quite thought of it as an act of worship. And so today, I'm going to ask you to participate in our worship service as an act of worship in this offering appeal. And our appeal this week is for Academy Operating. And um, we, as parents, Reba and I, we had the opportunity to send both of our kids, our children, to, um, to uh, church school. Uh, Joe was in the first class that uh, matriculated from first grade all the way through uh, the 12th grade at, at Midland. He was in that first class along with several other uh, 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 children of parents here in this sanctuary. And Amy got the opportunity to go to Sunnydale where our, our, our pastor went. And uh, w w the reality of running an academy hit us square in the head when we started getting the tuition bills for boarding academy. And I thought, you know, we're fortunate here in the Kansas City area because we have Midland. Praise the Lord, we have Midland. Uh, because uh, education is one of the three main elements of our church education and health and and uh and the word of god are the three things that our church is built on and it costs a tremendous amount of money and so our offering appeal for our loose offering is to help those uh, academies provide that kind of education that only you can get and um there is a scripture in 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 proverbs about uh, training our children in the way of the Lord, and they won't turn away from it when they get old. So uh, today's offering is, in, that, in, in fact, for the Academy uh, Operating Funds. And who knows that better in Kansas, the need to keep our Great Plains Academy and Midland operating well. So would the deacons please stand? Heavenly Father, today we have an opportunity to return our offerings uh, to you. And we just praise the Lord that we have the ability to do that. So we ask now that you'll bless these funds. Bless our academies as well, that they will continue to teach our children uh, the love of, of you, that, that when they uh, do grow old and have their own, own families, that they'll be able to share that love with them as well. In Jesus' name, we ask this. Amen.
This morning for a ministry moment, I want to invite you on such a very cold day to help warm some hearts over at the nursing home, Trinity Nursing Home. It's been a while since we've had any helpers come along, so I want to encourage anyone that may have an interest in spreading some cheer and song at Trinity Nursing Home at 3.30 this afternoon. If you don't know where that's at, um, you can look on the internet. I don't have the address memorized, but if you know where Russell Stowers is off Shawnee Mission Parkway, it's just up behind that. There's an apartment complex just above the hill where that stoplight, just where you turn into Russell Stover's, go up the hill a little bit, there's an apartment complex turned to the right. You'll see their sign easily there. We could show you some help if you're willing to sing over at Trinity Nursing Home this afternoon. And one more reminder is it's still not too late to either participate in or invite someone to the Financial Peace University. Uh, the next pre or the last preview, rather, begins tomorrow night at 6.30 p.m. So uh, I'm sure Tom and Matt would love to have some more participants in that. And uh, there's already several people that have signed up from our community. And uh, if you have an interest in that or a sense of need of financial improvement, that's a great place to begin. Thank you. for our scripture and prayer. Anybody here have any concerns or thanksgivings? We'll mention those during the prayer with our, um, others. Uh, we have our scripture reading today is Psalm 16, I'm sorry, Proverbs 16, verse 20. He who heeds the word wisely will find good, and whoever trusts in the Lord, happy is he. Well, those that are able, kneel with me, and uh, if you want to look at the special concerns, they're under item 9 in your announcements later. We're so grateful that we can be here today and enjoy this warm church and what you've given us here, Lord, in this land of freedom, this land where we can come to church when we want and where we want. And we're so grateful that so many here have chosen to do that. Lord, be with all those people who raised their hands and those that even didn't. We all have concerns and thanksgivings. We want you to know about them and, 
And I know you can read our thoughts and you know what's going on in each person's heart right now. Lord, I want to especially um, thank the people in this church that have taken their time and talent to put on programs here for the community, for the uh, local area, and the people that are responding to that. Lord, just help us to keep reaching out to this neighborhood and do what we can for this spot in the world. Lord, we want people to get closer to you. We want them to learn about your love. We want them to become like you. And Lord, the only way we can do that is if we are like you. So Lord, forgive us of our sins. Help us to grow closer to you. May the message today preached by uh, Pastor Mike be something uplifting and something that will bring us closer and learn more about how we can show that you're in our heart to the people that are around us. Lord, we want all these things to just be what you would have. Lord, in your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, if you're worshiping with us this morning because your church is closed because of the weather, welcome. You're welcome anytime. Uh, if you're just uh, a guest visiting um, Chapel Oaks, some of the Adventist church today for the very first time, I want to welcome you as well. You're welcome here anytime. And uh, my, oh my, I still am just taken back by all the snow out there. How about you? I, I don't remember this much snow uh, even when I was a kid, this early. Uh, maybe a little later in January, I remember a few heavy snows, but that, not that many days in a row where it hung around. This is just truly, truly amazing. But we're thankful it's warm in here, and we're thankful the Spirit of God has been promised to warm our hearts and lead us to, to worship Him today in spirit and in truth. I want to return to last week's topic. This is part two of last week's topic. Last week, we studied the pursuit of happiness. The pursuit of happiness. You know, I, I was browsing uh, on the web uh, in preparation for this for some illustrations, and I stumbled across a collection of quotes by famous philosophers, and I think it may have been uh, the philosopher Albert Camus, it may not pronounce his name right, but he says, uh, that's a foolish statement. You'll never find happiness if you pursue it. Well, that's kind of depressing. I think God has put the desire to find true happiness in our heart, and he intends that we shall find it. Amen? True happiness, that is. And that's what we want to look at today, real happiness, real happiness from the Word of God. Last week, we considered Webster's, Webster's Dictionary definition of happiness. I'm not going to return to that today because I've got plenty more to share this morning. We considered the measurement of happiness. The Bible intends, God intends in His Word, He promises that we shall be filled with the joy of the Lord filled with happiness, but we also noticed there is another way to measure the happiness that God promises, and that is the capacity to hold happiness itself. God intends shall be expanding and increasing. In fact, he intends that that shall take place throughout all eternity, and that's one of the most exciting things about heaven to me, is you can never reach not only the end of the happiness, but your opportunity to expand your capacity to hold more will always be growing. And I find that tremendously exciting. The Bible tells us in Psalm 16, 11, you will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. We studied this last week. In your presence is fullness of joy. Well, the good news is we don't have to wait to be in God's physical presence up in heaven to experience the fullness of joy because His very presence is promised to us in this life, isn't it? Through the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Lord can be just as near as if we were in His visible presence right now. Jesus said in John 14, verse 18, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. He told that to His disciples, knowing they were going to be sadly disappointed when He left them. And they would feel lonely. But he's trying to assure them, you don't have to feel lonely. You won't have to be empty because I will come to you. He's talking about the promise of his spirit that would bring his presence to the believer. In John 14, 23, Jesus answered and said, If anyone loves me and keeps my word, my Father will love him. And he says, And we will come to him and make our home with him. 
So to find the presence of God, ask him to, ask him to be near. Ask him to bring his presence to you, and he will do that very thing. But on this issue of happiness, the presence of the Lord brings happiness, but there are some principles that Jesus would encourage us to understand in terms of experiencing the presence of God in its fullness in our life. And I want to consider that with you this morning. But first, I want to look at happiness from somewhat of, it's a positive view, but it's a secular view. And what I want you to, I, I want you to pay attention very carefully. These are, uh, some of them are humorous, but uh, it, it's a realist. It's uh, Charles Schultz that wrote the Peanuts column. And this actually, this little poem about happiness comes from You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown. And uh, there's a lot of truth in this little poem. But there's some contrast that I want to consider with you as well. So listen carefully. Happiness is learning to whistle, tying your shoe for the very first time. Happiness is playing the drum in your own school band. And happiness is walking hand in hand. Happiness is two kinds of ice cream, knowing a secret, climbing a tree. Happiness is five different crayons, catching a firefly, setting him free. Happiness is being alone every now and then, and happiness is coming home again. Happiness is morning and evening, daytime and nighttime too, for happiness is anyone and anything at all that's loved by you. Happiness is having a sister, Oh, yeah, some kids would say. No, yeah. Sharing a sandwich, getting along. Happiness is singing together when day is through, and happiness is those who sing with you. Happiness is morning and evening, daytime and nighttime too, for happiness is anyone and anything at all that's loved by you. Now, there's a lot of truth in that simple little poem about life, most of it as a kid, right? A lot of truth in there. But I would, I would urge you to consider with me, there really are two kinds of happiness. There is a happiness that springs from circumstances being agreeable. Webster included that in his definition we looked at, looked at last week. But there's another kind of happiness that no matter what the circumstances are on the outside, it begins within and radiates without. I believe that's the kind of happiness that the Lord intends for us to have, regardless of outward circumstances. Jesus himself, you probably remember many of the little statues, newspaper columns, posters, and so forth. Happiness is dot, 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 and there might be a picture up there. You remember those? Okay. Did you know Jesus himself, Jesus himself authored a series of happiness statements as well? Quite a bit different perspective than those that you would see on the posters or the little statues. But Jesus authored a series of happiness statements. Do you know where they are? Do you know where those happiness, happiness is? The Beatitudes. The Beatitudes. In fact, many of the modern translations, rather than blessed are, and you know the rest of those statements, begin with happy are. Okay? Happiness. So that really is an honest way to look at the Beatitudes. The source of real happiness. Although, I would say if we're honest, or if we consider, if, if we plug in the word happiness there, there is a slight adjustment that would need to take place. You know, happiness is not mourning. They're not one and the same thing. That's contradictory. But happiness does spring from mourning, if we understand mourning in the sense that Jesus, and we are going to consider that this morning. So, rather than happiness is, consider these from happiness springs from. And I want you to notice if you miss the rest of today's subject and you get this next statement, this is good enough, all right? So stay with me for this. And then if you have to sleep, I'll let you sleep. But you'll probably miss something else that's important too if you choose to do that. The difference between Jesus' happiness statements and the happiness statements that we read in Charles Schultz's poem or the happiness statues or little trinkets that say happiness is, the difference very clearly is. The happiness Jesus talks about does not count on outward circumstances. It's not dependent upon outward circumstances. The happiness that Jesus promises. Now very clearly, the reason I'm absolutely convinced of that, this, this just recently clicked in my mind. When you read through the Beatitudes, and open your, your Bibles to Matthew 5, and we're going to take it one by one, 
very quickly this morning. Yes, there's plenty of time to do that without going over, okay? Um, believe me, I'd be tempted to, to uh, do a whole sermon on each one, but I was warned when I came here. You know, the last pastor did months on the Beatitudes and on the Sermon on the Mount, so that's probably not the best place to begin. Well, finally, I get to talk about them, and I'm just going to do one day, okay, for now, just one day. So if those of you that, that uh, felt like that was a bit long-winded, I'm not going to take that long in the Beatitudes, all right? But stay with me now. You recall the very last, or next to the last statement Jesus makes here in Matthew 5, along about verse 9 or 10, right in there. I'll open my Bible here in a moment and get right to it, but I'm just doing some introductory remarks. Happy are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. That flies directly in the face of what the popular definition of happiness is, doesn't it? I mean, the very worst of circumstances, I mean, it's bad enough to get beat up, made fun of, spit on, or whatever type of mockery or abuse might come to a person. That's bad enough. But when you've done what is right, when you've done what is good and true and faithful in your relationship with God, and you find happiness in the midst of that, that kind of turns topsy-turvy the popular understanding that happiness is tied to outward circumstances, doesn't it? Because in the worst of circumstances, humanly speaking, you're getting abused for doing right, for loving the way God loves. Happiness is not dependent upon outward circumstances. In Jesus' theology, in Jesus' teaching, happiness, happiness comes from God, starts within, and it radiates outward. All right? So hang on to that thought. Now, there's another thought that I just love. My favorite book outside of the Bible in studying the Sermon on the Mount is the book Thoughts on the Mount of Blessing. I hope you have a copy. It's an old, old book. And uh, if you'd like to obtain one, you don't have one, I might have an extra one here, but uh, speak to me afterwards. I'd love to share a wonderful experience with you. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing. And there's one line in here that I just find intriguing and challenging and increases my appetite to try and penetrate more into the deep things of the Word of God. This is page 13 from Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing. It goes like this. Throughout the Beatitudes, there is an advancing line of Christian experience. Throughout the Beatitudes, there's an advancing line of Christian experience. Now listen, I find that exciting in two different ways. First of all, I find that exciting because it challenges me to realize, listen, if I want to talk about what growth consists of, I want to mature as a Christian, that's going to help me see what Jesus is talking about. When he talks about spiritual maturity and the levels of spiritual maturity, that's a place to go to look at Jesus' understanding an explanation of how we mature, the stages of development in our Christian experience. There's an advancing line, but you know what else it tells me? Remember last week we considered our capacity to hold happiness, our capacity to hold anything from the kingdom of God, spiritual things, increases in God's economy. So what I can also find when I look at the Beatitudes with this concept in mind, there's an advancing line of Christian experience that also means that also would mean then each level of, of maturity means there's an expansion which enables more of the joy and presence of the Lord to fill one's life. Are you with me? So when we were talking about expansion last week, and we want to understand how that expansion takes place, here's some steps apparently in expanding our capability for holding what the, the deep things of the kingdom that God has for us, especially the true and lasting happiness that heaven plans for us. The first beatitude in verse 3, and I, I want to preface this with one more thing too. Jesus exemplified something that some people really struggle with. He's the Son of God, and yet we find Jesus saying in the Gospel of John, I can of mine own self do nothing. Do you remember Jesus saying that? Never forget Jesus is our example when he makes that statement. I can of mine own self do nothing. And the reason people find that challenging is, oh my, that's why everything was so easy for Jesus. He was divine. But Jesus came, though he was divine, he took humanity upon himself, and he came to live life as human beings must live it, in dependence upon someone else. He was dependent upon the Father. 
And if we want to be literal to the words of Jesus, if you'll read John 5 and 6 very carefully, Jesus says, the same way I depended upon the Father, that's how I want you to depend upon me. But the principle is the same in each case. Dependence upon another to live the life that God wants us to live. Now, when it comes to the Beatitudes, here's what we need to remember. If we participate in any of the attitudes and behaviors that are described in the Beatitudes, it's not because we're some great person. It's not because we're innately good or innately strong. Not at all. If we do, it's simply because we decided to stop fighting against what the Spirit of God has always been trying to lead us to. There's a big difference. No one in this world gets the bright idea of being loyal to God on their own. It can only come from God himself. So if that's the case, one might ask, then what hinders the whole world from arriving at spiritual maturity if it's the business of God? Well, that's really quite simple. Some people choose to resist. Other people choose to surrender and submit. That's the difference. All right? At each stage of development, that is going to be the case as well. We may surrender initially and then later on resist. So those who advance in the stages of spiritual development Jesus describes in the Sermon on the Mount, and namely the Beatitudes, are those who at each crossroads where decision is called for choose, again, not to resist what God wants to accomplish. They choose to yield and surrender. All right, so keep that in mind as a background for these. The first one, verse 3, Happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Happiness, according to Jesus, comes from the realization there is nothing in me that is good. That is measured in God's economy. It might be humanly looked at as good. But in God's economy, happy are those who realize when it comes to spiritual things, I myself can do nothing. I am spiritually bankrupt. Happiness will come from that confession and heart admission before the Lord. I'm spiritually bankrupt, and there is nothing I can do of myself to merit the favor of heaven. I am in poverty, but I know someone who is generous. I know someone who is giving and yielding and who surrendered all for my sake. And because of that, I'm drawn to him, and because of that, I'm willing to admit I am spiritually bankrupt. For only then do we realize I can receive the help now that heaven wants to offer me. But as long as I'm self-sufficient and think I've kind of got it together, heaven really can't help me. In the day when Jesus made this statement, proud and self-confident religious leaders called Pharisees were looked upon by common people as the most spiritually favored. After all, they had power, they had material wealth. And in, in the days when Jesus taught these statements, it was commonly believed that, that power and influence and money and the things that money can buy were indications of the favor of heaven. It can be, but you know what? Poverty can be too. Poverty can be too. We should always do our best, but you know what? Some people get stuck in poverty, even they're doing the best they can with what they have. And you know what? In the providence of God, God knows that's the safest way to get them to the kingdom. While other people, God says, you know what? They may mess it up, but I can see from my view, if I bless them with wealth and the ability to gain wealth, they will, be un they, they will understand and have the opportunity to share it unselfishly and further my cause. They'll have the freedom to use it selfishly, and some people do. But in the providence of God, if God chooses to provide those opportunities and avenues for someone to gain wealth, his expectation is they will use it as God uses his wealth unselfishly. So the, the, the mechanisms are in place. It could happen. It doesn't always happen. But uh, wealth, though, just remember this. Wealth, literal wealth, and poverty can both be a blessing when we look at life from God's perspective. Now, that doesn't mean we look at the poverty-stricken like some do in Indian and say, well, the gods arrange it that way, so that's where they want it. So we shouldn't try and help their position. Not at all. Not at all. I'm not headed there. We should have mercy on those that are less fortunate than us, no matter what station in life we find ourselves. Now, 
Just because we are to have a humble estimation of ourself and admit that we are spiritually bankrupt does not mean that we move mentally to the opposite extreme of life in considering ourselves a worthless piece of trash. That is foreign to the teaching of Jesus Christ. Not at all. God does not want us to, to think of ourselves as, as worthless or, or a, a, a piece of trash. Not at all. Jesus died for us. That increases our value. We are valuable, or he wouldn't have died for us, but the fact that he died for us even increases our value in heaven's eyes. After all, Jesus' sermon in which we find the Beatitudes includes these classic statements. Consider the sparrows. You're, if God cares for sparrows, don't you know you are more valuable than them? And then he turns his hearers' attention to the lilies, and he says, look how beautiful they are. If heaven invested so much in clothing a lily with such beauty, what do you think his thoughts are of you? So that's not the direction God wants us to go in, in telling us when Christ tells us we are to be poor in spirit. Not at all. We're just to admit we're spiritually bankrupt, and every good gift, whether spiritual or literal, comes down from heaven, and we're completely dependent upon him. And happy, happy will be those who realize this, for they are prepared to receive everything that heaven has for them, including genuine and true happiness. Verse 4, happy are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. See, this is the one that led me to believe it's not fair and honest to say happiness is mourning. It's more accurate to say true happiness springs from the experience of mourning. Mourning? You mean when someone dies? Well, really, that is God's plan. Real happiness won't begin until we die to self. <laughs> and it's, it's going to take some mourning for that to take place. And we'd never be sorry enough to mourn for those things that we think initially bring us happiness. That is the love of self and sin. But through an act of the Spirit of God, we begin to look at life differently. Why? Because we've had a glimpse of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary suffering for self-centered living, suffering in our behalf. And as we look at Jesus crucified on the cross of Calvary, if we'll let him, the Spirit of God will bring sharply to our attention, that is my responsibility that he is suffering on that cross. That is my responsibility, that he is in agony, crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when we permit that vision of the Christ of Calvary to penetrate our hardened hearts, that is when we begin to mourn for our sins. We begin to mourn for him whom our sins have crucified. And we see it was us with the whip in our hand. It is us. If we would have been there, it would have been us driving the nails, spitting, mocking, plucking out his beard. That view of the Christ of Calvary causes us to mourn if we'll open our hearts to the work of the Spirit. And the Bible says, Jesus says, they'll be comforted. We will be comforted in that kind of mourning. God reveals our guilt to us for one reason. And that is that we may awaken to our senses, turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, and receive freedom from the bondage and the condemning guilt of our sin. Real happiness comes from experiencing that marvelous transaction. Verse 5, happy are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now listen, meekness is not weakness. Someone once said, if you think meek is weak, try being meek for a week. Meekness is not weakness. And I think the best illustration I can come up with to think of meekness in action, that certainly was a challenge, but it was also provided by God himself, as is every virtue of life provided by God. I remember the testimony of a pastor who served in Cuba when religious freedom was extremely limited. I'll never forget this portion of the testimony. I just cringed when I heard it. For you see, sugar cane, sugar cane was, uh, uh, the harvesting and making of sugar and harvesting the cane was a very important part of life. And the prison camp that this pastor, he was arrested and brought to this prison camp, largely due to, well, it was due to his faith in Jesus Christ and his evangelistic fervor to share the gospel in a communist country. They put him away. And when he arrived at this uh, prison camp, he worked faithfully, of course, he wasn't paid for it, 
and uh, barely got fed, and the necessities of life were uh, very, very primitive. But the day arrived that the Sabbath rolled around, and they worked from sun up till sundown. But that didn't change the fact that this Bible-believing Christian knew that doesn't change the fact that it's God's Sabbath. Even though they don't believe in it and don't respect it, it doesn't change the fact there's still a God on the throne who still has a plan of life that's the best way to live, even if others don't see it. And you know what? No matter what the circumstances, God's going to have to take care of this. And whether I suffer for it or whether he delivers me miraculously, it doesn't matter. That's in his hands. I just want to follow what Jesus tells me to do. So roll call happens that morning. And flooding from all over the cell blocks of this place where they were stationed were prisoners of this uh, concentration camp, I'll just call it, because that's what it was. But not my friend that I saw on this program one day. He stayed in his room. Pretty soon he began to hear the numbers called off. And when your number was called, you were to respond verbally. He was praying fervently for what would be considered an act of rebellion. Pretty soon he heard his number called repeatedly, and very shortly after he heard army boots tromping up the stairwell to his cell block. His heart began to pound, and his, his, his prayers began to pour out more fervently. And as soon as they entered the room, they began to confront him and began to mock him and tell him he was lazy and asked him why he wouldn't come. He was very direct, and he just told them, it's the Sabbath of the Lord. Today is Saturday, the seventh day, and it's God's Sabbath. And I will work for my government and my country every day of the week as hard as I possibly can, but not on the Sabbath day of the Lord. Well, they went into a rage, and there were two soldiers there, and one reached in the back of his shirt and yanked out an electrical cable that had many wires frayed from the end of it. And he said, I, I just didn't, he said, I, I immediately just doubled over. And they laid his back open repeatedly with that, uh, with that wire cable. And he just continued to pray until finally he passed out. And when he awakened, they began to mock him and make fun of him. And they said, what are you, man? Some kind of a pansy? And you're lazy. Get out there and work. Well, you know what? I think he had it right. He said, if you think what I'm going through is easy, I'd trade places with you in a minute. Meekness is not weakness. Jesus said he himself was meek. Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. Jesus was meek. What does it mean for him to be weak? Stay with me. At what point in, in life should we consider Jesus as an example of meekness from beginning to end? And when I talk about beginning, I'm talking about in heaven as the decision is made to leave heaven for this earth. Listen, this is from the 20th century New Testament. It's Philippians 2. If you want to look at it in your version, feel free to do so. Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. Though the divine nature was his from the beginning... Yet he did not look upon equality with God as above all things to be clung to, but impoverished himself by taking the nature of a servant and becoming like men. Meekness, friends, involves an attitude of servanthood, and it is a twofold attitude. It is the dethronement of self to serve others, but it is also the dethronement of self to glorify God. Listen to the words of Jesus, John 8, verse 50. I do not seek my own glory. Meekness is seeking the glory of God and the blessing of others. Serving God and serving others. In John 8, 49, I honor my Father. The Father's honor is first and foremost in mine, in the life of a person who experiences biblical meekness. Jesus accepted the challenges of human life, not as a king, not to demand worship and homage, but Jesus lived as a common man who would serve others. Jesus emptied himself in all that he did, and in everything that he did, self did not once appear. His will was held in subjection to the Heavenly Father. 
Jesus calls us in Luke 9, 23. If anyone desires to come after me, do you want to follow me, Jesus would say? Then take up your cross daily and follow me. Meekness is the surrender of and subjection of self to the will and purposes of God for his glory and for the benefit of others around us. Verse 6. Happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Happiness comes from having the righteousness of Christ, the righteousness of God. Psalm 129, verse 4, says, The Lord is righteous. God is righteous. And he's calling us to have righteousness, to, to be his righteous people. Righteousness is love in the Bible. In 1 John 4, 16, the Bible says God is love. If God is righteous and God is love, it's axiomatic. Righteousness is love. It is also harmony with the law of God because in the Psalms, again, David says in Psalm 119, verse 172, all your commandments are righteousness. Righteousness is love, and love is the fulfilling of God's law, according to Romans 13.10. But the problem is, God's law cannot provide the very things that it describes. The law cannot provide those things. But God, through Jesus Christ, will. The righteousness of God, the love of God, the holiness of God is embodied in Jesus Christ himself. And we receive righteousness by receiving him as our personal Lord and Savior. So, in, in uh, the book of Isaiah, we are given this rich promise. Isaiah 54, verse 17. Their righteousness, speaking of his people, their righteousness is from me. So if we see righteousness happening, loving deeds principles that are in harmony with the Word of God going on in someone's life, you know the reason that's happening, right? It's because Christ is present. Christ is functioning through His Spirit in that person's life. Happiness comes from being hungry and thirsty for this article, the righteousness of Christ. Why? Because it is the assurance that you will be filled with it if you so desire it. Jesus said in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger. Will never hunger. Whoever believes in me will never thirst. That hunger is the promise. That thirst is the promise. You will be satisfied. Here's a quote from Thoughts on the Mount of Blessing that spoke to my heart on this topic. Not by painful struggles or wearisome toil, not by our gifts or sacrifice, is righteousness obtained. But it is freely given to every soul who hungers and thirsts to receive it. Can you say amen to that? It is yours freely and generously from God if you truly want it and desire it. Verse 7, happy are the merciful. Happiness springs from manifesting mercy. Why? They shall obtain mercy. Sin has caused our nature to be dark, self-centered, cold, and uncaring. So whenever someone manifests a spirit of mercy and compassion and forgiveness and care for other people, it's evidence the spirit of Jesus Christ is at work. John says in his epistle, we love because he first loved us. That's the only way it's possible. And God himself is the source of all mercy that takes place in this world. He's called in the book of Exodus, he himself is merciful and gracious. In the book of Micah, the Bible says he delights in mercy. That's just God's nature. That's what he's like. He, he, doesn't, he, doesn't, um, he does not treat us how we, in fact, deserve to be treated. He goes well over and beyond what we deserve and pours out his mercies upon us. He's not vindictive. He's not anxious to punish, but he is anxious to redeem. To be merciful, then, is to begin to treat other people the way God himself has treated us in all of his interaction with us. Well, it's true. The Bible does say in Exodus 34, he will by no means clear the guilty. He wouldn't be a just God if he just ignored our sin. 
but he is anxious to take the sin away. The sin and the guilt away is what he is in the business of doing. And those part, who partake of his nature, which the Bible says is what takes place when we're born again, we become a partaker of the divine nature. When we do, we begin to manifest that same attitude. We're more interested in removal of the sin, in redemption, than we are the punishment of someone who is guilty. The Christian's constant question in his relationship with others is, how can I benefit them? How can I benefit others? The merciful are those who have compassion on the poor, the suffering, and the oppressed as well. There's a lot of people that have a, a hard row to hoe today. We're around them every day of our life, at work, school, whatever our occupation is, our neighborhoods. We're around people every day that have a, a real struggle at living life. And sometimes as something as little as a kind word or a listening ear is all that it would take to lift their spirits and maybe someday even turn their attention towards the God of heaven and the Savior who loves them. You know, the good news about God's economy is, and it's really not only true with mercy, but here very literally it says, blessed are the merciful or happy are the merciful, for they will obtain mercy. The amazing thing about God's economy is what you send out has a tendency to come back. So if mercy is what you are broadcasting, you know what? Even in this life, you will find very often mercy is what you, in fact, will reap from others that you fellowship with. But the good news is, the good news is, even if we don't receive or understand or experience all the benefits of living according to God's purposes, we are promised that someday all the riches of heaven's blessing and, and grace and happiness will be ours throughout all eternity. We'll be compensated in the next life. Verse 8, happy are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You know, I think of James' words on this. The wisdom that is from above is first pure. And concerning those that enter the holy city, John in the book of Revelation says, nothing impure will enter it, that is, that city. So I've got to ask a question today, men. And I know this is a weakness that uh, appeals especially to men. And that is, what are you watching on the internet? Is it contributing to a pure heart? You know, the internet is both a curse and a blessing. A blessing in that information is easily accessible. A curse because some kinds of information really ought not to be accessible. Some kinds of images ought not to be accessible. We are paying a heavier and heavier price for the easy access to pornography on the Internet. It is eating out the heart of our nation. And let me say one more thing. It's eating out the heart of the ministry and many Christians as well. It's a temptation to which many Christians have yielded. And I don't know who you are, but I have no doubt there is somebody here struggling with this very issue of purity of heart today. And all I can say to you, friend, is if you cry out in your helplessness to the Savior who's in the business of purifying sinful hearts, he will hear your prayer. He may put you in touch with someone, maybe not in this congregation, maybe you need to seek some outside help, but he also has the ability to providentially put you in touch with people that can take you the next step if you're really, really in a struggle. You cannot be happy with an impure heart. It's impossible. But Jesus isn't just talking about moral or um, sensual purity when he speaks of a pure heart. Actually, there's something much deeper. And the book Thoughts on the Mount of Blessing has a tremendous insight on this. Listen to this. It is being free from that which is uh, or excuse me, it is being true, rather, in the hidden purposes and motives of the soul. It is free from pride and self-seeking. So it's not just matters of sensuality, it's the whole principle of self-serving that brings impurity to the heart and the soul. Listen, the problem we have is we tend to look at God as we would look at any other person. As if God has some kind of self-centered motivations in his economy. Nothing could be further from the truth. Listen to this sharp rebuke from God in the Psalms where he says in Psalm 50, verse 21, You thought that I was altogether like you. 
sin has damaged us in such a way, we tend to frame God in human terms and look at him like another human being. That's terrible because humanity is selfish. God is exactly the opposite. In fact, when Jesus walked the earth, this is, this is exactly why Jesus walked among men largely unrecognized. Because people were not in tune with what God was really like when God walked among them, they didn't recognize him. The most magnificent thing about God is his character, not his appearance. Jesus came to demonstrate that. If he would have awed them with glory, surely everybody would have bowed the knee and said, well, here he is, you know. God wants to be recognized for who he is on the inside, and so he came under the veil of the flesh of humanity. And why wasn't he recognized? Because people did not, most people did not discern God's loving and unselfish character. And many who did despised it when he manifested it. Why do you think it is that so many, peop- so many people that read the Bible say, what a boring dead letter. Bores me to tears. Irritates me when I open it up. How can anyone find joy and meaning and happiness in the Bible? There's only one reason for that. Their conception of his character is foreign to the person they're reading about. God is unselfish, self-sacrificing and giving in ways that do not appeal to the natural heart. And he calls forth the same from you and me. We were made in his image, and as image bearers, we are to reflect that same type of character that is foreign to the natural heart. The reverse is true. You know, there's something about God that I find amazing. And that is, we can't see his character all at once. We get glimpses as we grow. In much the same way, when I visited the Grand Canyon, every position that Brett and I drove to or walked to, the view improved. And so it is with the character of God. Unless we're moving with him, the view of the beauty of his character will not be fully seen unless we're traveling with him. Are you with me? Someday, God's going to come back. And when he does, people are going to run, some people, that is, are going to run from his face because they consider him an enemy. And others will shout for joy because they know this is the friend they have so long been waiting for. The last one that we'll we'll cover today, that is the peacemakers. Happy are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Christians have been blamed for many of the wars around the world. But if we are really honest with history, we would say those are professed Christians. Because no Christian that has Bible Christianity is going to be out on their horses with swords and spears and guns and whatever weapons of warfare they might conjure up to convert people to Christ. Nothing could be more foreign to the spirit of the gospel than using force to bring about a conversion. And yet that is where many of the wars came from. People people that unfairly criticize Christianity for that need to reconsider. Those people, though some of them may have had a Christian experience, certainly had a misunderstanding of how the gospel functions and how people are to be converted. But it is true that even in parts of the world where Christians were not the ones inciting the wars through the Crusades or whatever it might be, it is true that wars sprang up as a result of Christianity's influence. But we shouldn't blame Christianity for that. We should blame the enemies of the gospel. Christianity is a message of peace. And yet Jesus paradoxically does say in Matthew 10, 34, do not suppose that I came to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Well, the paradox is, Jesus will bring peace to whoever yields to his claims of lordship upon them. He will. He will bring peace to that person. However, we are not naturally inclined to yield to his claims, are we? In fact, Paul says in Romans 8, 7, the sinful mind is hostile towards God. We're God-haters by nature. We, We may not say that, But the Bible says because of our actions and our response to heaven's claims on how we ought to be living. We can say whatever we say, oh, I don't dislike God. But if our life is in rebellion against his commandments in any way, shape, or form, the Bible says we're God-haters. That's our nature, okay? 
But when a person surrenders to Christ, all of this changes. As Paul says in Romans 5, since we have been justified by faith, we experience conversion. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And having experienced, having gone through the misery of being at war with God and then coming to peace by yielding to him, we become equipped to be peacemakers ourselves, to share with others the peace that we have found in surrendering to Jesus Christ. We become a missionary as a result of that. Again, thoughts and amount of blessing. Whoever by a quiet, unconscious influence of a holy life, that's a life where Jesus abides, shall reveal the love of Christ. Whoever by word or deed shall lead another to renounce sin and yield his heart to God, he is a peacemaker. I'm going to leave you with this thought, and I invite you to open your Bible. This is the last text we're going to look at, and I am wrapping up right now. Micah chapter 5, verse 7. Talk about a peacemaker. If there's something that I would encourage you to seek the Lord for, to contemplate, to think about, pray about, I believe it would be the idea contained in this verse here as it relates to being a peacemaker. To be a peacemaker really is to be an evangelist wherever we're at. Not a public speaker. Just wherever you find yourself, whatever group you're in, you're an influencer for Jesus Christ. Here's how Micah describes the condition of God's ideal for the experience of his people, his happy people. The remnant of Jacob, that's God's people, shall be in the midst of many peoples like a dew from the Lord. Dew is a refreshing element, isn't it? It's, it's moisture, refreshment. Like showers on the grass. Don't you like the, the beauty on a uh, 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 the sun rises and, and the sprinkles have been going or it's just rain and the sun's rising and you see the glisten on the grass. Can't you just see that when you read this? Like a dew from the Lord, like showers on the grass. Now get this, that tarry or wait, in other words, for no man nor wait for the sons of men. Here's the most amazing thing about the operation of God's grace in his life as witness in the Beatitudes. Now listen carefully, don't miss this. It's natural, it's natural to get a sense for how other people might respond to us before we act. That's natural. But Christianity is a supernatural experience, bringing a supernatural influence and power into our life. And so in, later in this very sermon, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus challenges his people. He says, what do you do more than others? Even sinners greet people in the marketplace. Hey, Joe, how you doing? Everybody does that. So what Jesus, I believe, is challenging us today is the same idea. Are you waiting before you begin to share the refreshment and do from the Lord? Are we waiting on what the response of others might be? Or are we going to be what God has called us to be in this passage today? Happiness? Where does happiness come from according to Jesus? Humbling our hearts before him, confessing our spiritual poverty, surrendering self and selfish ambition to serve as his disciples, seeking with hunger and thirst for his character of love, manifesting the mercy that we have received from him towards all with whom we come in contact, functioning in all our relationships with people's good, other people's good, uppermost in our mind, and serving as an ambassador of heaven's peace by spreading the gospel in every word and action. Will you join me in seeking happiness God's way this year? Amen. Please stand with me and sing hymn number 330, Take My Life and Let It Be. Hymn number 330. We'll sing the first and last stanzas this morning, okay? First and last stanzas. Take my life and let it be Consecrated, Lord, to Thee Take my hands and let them Second stanza, it's easier for them. 
take my let them be swift and beautiful for thee take my voice and let me sing always only for my king always only for my king let's pray together Loving Father, thank you for this time that we've shared together. And uh, I pray that, Lord, as we consider Jesus' teaching on true happiness, that it comes from your presence. But if your presence is within us, the experiences that Jesus describes in the Beatitudes will be taking place. So, Lord, I pray that you will soften our hearts if we're resisting At any stage of development that Jesus describes, if we're resisting, please lead us to have a fresh view of what caused your suffering, self in the way. Save us from that. Save us from our sins. I pray that you will accomplish what you so long to do, and that is truly make us like a dew from the Lord in the midst of many people that we don't wait to see what others will do, but we respond to your promptings now.